I actually am very honored to be here. And, you know, arsenic toxicity is something that I just find absolutely fascinating. Just the way it sort of interplays with the human body and really the history of arsenic toxicity. And I had a lot of fun actually going through and looking how arsenic's been used in the past and how it's being used today and what our approaches are and how we're looking towards the future. I had a lot of fun putting this together and I really hope that I can sort of convey some of, you know, that excitement that I felt going through um, sort of a lot about the arsenic's been in the past. And so, unfortunately, I have no financial disclosures, not for lack of trying, but I am very fortunate that I'm part of this cataract grant. And a couple things we're going to talk about is sort of the history of arsenic poisoning, sort of what are the clinical presentations of arsenic poisoning, and really what is going on worldwide, because I think worldwide is where we're really seeing some of the forefront of what we're learning about arsenic, and then really what does the future hold. But arsenic, just from a historical you know, presence, it's just absolutely fascinating. You know, in antiquity, it was used as poisoning, um, recognized by the Greeks as sort of a, a very terrible poison, one that was also readily available since arsenic's formed naturally in the uh, earth crust. But I think it really got exciting in sort of the Renaissance era, and it really became sort of the forefront or sort of the, you know, the cool toxin or the cool poison out there to use just because it became so widespread. And I think no one made it more widespread than actually the Borgia family. You know, they were so popular that Showtime even made a TV show about them. And they had very prominent members uh, throughout sort of the late medieval age, early Renaissance period. Alexander VI is known as sort of the head of the Borgia family, and then his son Caesar Borgia was actually who Machiavelli wrote his famous book, The Prince, uh, sort of the inspiration for. And they were very renowned uh, political schemers, and they had multiple rivals. And Pope Alexander VI, he's really sort of credited as being one of the original popes that took the Pope in Rome as being just a holy father to also being head of the papal states. And so he really became or was instrumental in almost making the pope as a small monarchy as well. And so because of that, he also developed a lot of political rivals and became very, I think, facile in the use or the advantages of using arsenic toxicity. And they were so widespread in using it, it's unknown just exactly how many people they actually either poisoned or ultimately killed. And they really specialized it, and the rumor or the folklore that's built up around this is they had these cellars, so they would actually store their poisons, and they would talk about them as vintages, just like you would talk about wine today. And what they were really focusing on is sort of this slow but reliable killer. Because if you think about sort of a really quick poison, is if someone drinks from a wine glass, you serve them, and they die right away, well, it looks like you're the culprit. But the Borgias are really sort of credited as this idea of creating a slow poison, one that could be tough to really identify as who was the perpetrator. And so they probably came up with what's the most po famous poison known in history, La uh, Cantarella. Hopefully no one here actually speaks Italian and can correct me in my terrible pronunciation. But again, a lot of this is folklore that's built up around it. But the thought is that they would actually feed high doses of arsenic also with uh, belladonna as well, to pigs. And what they would do is then when the pigs started eventually seizing and having this frothy sort of sputum come out, they would actually collect that frothy sputum and they would use that actually really to concentrate and to make their poison. And one of the geniuses they did is when by mixing with belladonna, belladonna is a natural sort of plant, is in deadly nightshade, but it also has very profound anticholinergic uh, properties. And what that means is it can really slow down the GI tract and really cause a lot of cons constipation, delayed absorption. With the idea that even though, as we'll talk about in a couple slides, as we know arsenic, at least acutely, tends to cause a lot of GI distress, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, by mixing it with belladonna, is they could get delayed absorption over hours to days, and thereby sort of try to create this more of a slow and deliberate type of poisoning. And when you read about people that were actually poisoned by La Cantarella, it's a little bit horrified how they were able to get this people to eat this pig froth. 
somehow they got that, is people came in with confusion, vomiting, abdominal pain, you know, which again can be a great mimicker. And I think that's one of the geniuses about arsenic as a historical poison, it's just it mimics so many other disease processes that goes around with it. One of the other famous poisoners that came a little bit later is Catherine de Chais, who is French. And I really just want to talk about her because she developed this nickname as uh, La Voisin, which translates to the neighbor. She was actually known to be a friend of all these women, and she really developed arsenic as this idea of an inheritance powder. And the inheritance powder was, it's just so if women were in unhappy marriages, is that, or if they want to sort of direct the inheritance down a certain line, is they would go to the neighbor, who was this friendly woman, and get this powder from her. And she actually called it sort of uh, le pure de succession. Again, I know I absolutely butchered that. But I love that, like, you know, the powder of succession, trying to create, you know, who's going to get this inheritance. And she actually ended up becoming fairly renowned, mostly posthumously, uh, really as her reputation, I think, grew. But she also recognized that you wanted to use arsenic as to get delayed absorption with it, which is why she also mixed it with belladonna as well as opium. Opium will also slow down the gut GI tract, thereby creating a lot more of that slow, deliberate poisoning that was really sort of prized in the Renaissance era. And this is unfortunately a really terrible uh, depiction of her, but it's the best I could find on the internet. And then probably of the most famous is this idea of aqua tofana, which really came about in the early 17th century. And what happened in, this comes from, or originated in Palermo in Sicily. And what happened is really this cult of women developed and they were led by Giuliana Tofana, which is what got this name. And she developed this, I guess, liquid that was known as sufficient to destroy a man. Now, a lot of this terminology about it actually came by after she'd already passed away. Uh, but they were also using this as uh, succession powders, but also, as legend goes, is women were using this in pretty abusive relationships with men or in marriages they were trying to get out of. And there was a lot of folklore about it. In fact, in Palermo, is they got onto this group of women, and so they actually moved to Rome, and Giuliana Tofana actually died around 1650, but in 1659, there was this very famous trial in Rome where a lot of the women that were sort of implicated in her gang were actually hung. And then after this, it's really sort of this folklore, this reputation of Aqua Tofana, also became known as the Water of Palermo, where they originated from as this, you know, way to get out of these terrible uh, marriages. And what's interesting about this is after the Aqua Tofana sort of experience, is arsenic, for whatever reason, really became known as sort of a poisoning that women would use and became known as sort of like a feminine poisoning. And it sort of became a lot, you see a lot of in books still written about it. It's talking about sort of arsenic as this great uh, poisoning. But if you read a lot of it is, you know, the protagonist always seems to be female and trying to get rid of, you know, abusive relationships. And it really goes back to sort of this whole experience of Aqua Tofana and how sort of how widespread sort of or her reputation grew as it grew throughout Europe. So going a little bit more recently, so to 1900, and a lot of what I read about this beer epidemic, I think sort of hits close to home for a lot of us, including myself, comes from this book, which I found, it's just amazing what you can find in Google. This book was published in 1908 on the uh, beer epidemic that actually occurred in 1900 in England. And it's really fascinating how they figured this out because in Staffordshire, what happened is heavy drinkers started coming in to their physician with muscle weakness, paresthesias, all of this numbness of their distal extremities. And multiple people had been diagnosed actually with alcoholic uh, neuritis. But what was interesting is this Dr. Reynolds, he was actually an epidemiologist at the time, is, well, he knows there was a big sort of spike in people being diagnosed with alcoholic neuritis. I think in this one month they had 41 people succumbed or if you read actually what Dr. Reynolds wrote about it initially, is in the previous two months there was only a total of 19 people. And what's interesting is he got more and more into what's actually causing this alcoholic neuritis. You know, why are people coming in this really severe peripheral neuropathy? Is he actually discovered it was really beer drinkers, people that actually drank uh, liquor and clear spirits, 
were not being diagnosed with alcoholic neuritis and not coming in with this constellation of symptoms. And so he had the wherewithal, I think, to go to the uh, pubs around Staffordshire in England. I mean, it seems like a pretty great idea if you're an epidemiologist, you get to go visit a bunch of bars and collect samples of beer. And what he found out is actually the beer had incredibly high levels of arsenic. And then so 10 years later is Kelly Knack and Kirby actually published this book about it. And as I was getting ready for this talk and reading about it, I just really could not put this book down. I'd be happy to share this with anyone because it's freely available on the internet. I have the PDF from it. But there are depictions of what acute and chronic uh, arsenic toxicity is so on point and so much consistent to what we know about now, what I'll be talking about here in a couple of slides. And so I really just actually want to highlight some of the phrases that come out of their, you know, this 1910 work looking at these arsenic uh, beer drinkers that came in with this severe neuropathy. Because one of the other reasons that sort of keyed Dr. Reynolds on that this is more than just alcoholic neuritis is this really profound skin changes that people are happening. And uh, unfortunately, I think sort of some of the commentary or the sort of underlying culture of the time sort of comes through in the way that Kelnaki wrote about this because he talks about this really distinctive pigmented skin changes um, that gives the patient a gypsy-like appearance. And then here at the bottom, he talks about that this appearance is just really so profound that even his dullest patients had noticed uh, what, that something else was going on with them. I just, right now in 2019, I can never ever imagine writing about someone uh, like that and you know, just being eviscerated for it. But it's also pretty profound the way he was identifying it, that it's really around the areola, around the nipples, the axle, the perineum. They were getting a lot of these really hyperpigmented uh, skin changes. Again, one of the reasons that clued Reynolds in that this was more than just alcoholic neuritis. And these are, I have actually a lot of pictures from this book uh, just because they're really profound. And so this actually comes from someone out of the Staffordshire beer epidemic. And you actually see this profound muscle wasting, this muscle atrophy that really uh, Reynolds first noticed and then Kelnaki uh, wrote a whole bunch about. And a lot of the, I think, the severe peripheral neuropathy. And even as we start going into more what are the acute changes that we know today is I still like to bring a lot of these original Kelnaki photos into it. Just I think from a historical standpoint, it's just how consistent is what he was describing then as to what we're seeing today. And eventually what they found out is actually it was the cold that was used to heat the barley had incredibly high levels of arsenic in it. And this is, uh, Reynolds is the one that eventually uh, figured this out, I believe in conjunction with some other epidemiologists. And it's just pretty fascinating they were able to do this root cause analysis, I think, in the 1900s and really go back to, hey, it was arsenic, um, which they were getting near a mine that just happened to have very high concentrations of arsenic that was able to sort of give the arsenic to the barley and thereby, even in the beer, concentrate it to severely high levels. Because when you read this book, you'll find that a lot of these people that end up getting diagnosed in this epidemic never actually got better. Um, just had really irreversible, severe peripheral neuropathy and um, a lot of mobilization issues. Moving on to a little bit more recently is, this actually comes from 1986 in North Carolina. And the quotes I have here, actually I pulled from this original, the original newspaper article from 86. This is about Blanche Moore. And Blanche Moore was known to be this like very kind, very sweet woman. She initially married, her father actually died of a heart attack when she was very young. And she was a single woman and married, her first husband was uh, Jim Taylor. And unfortunately, Jim Taylor then died in his 40s, what was actually at that point also diagnosed as a heart attack. And then she started dating someone else who ultimately passed away, and he actually got diagnosed as Guillain-Barre syndrome. And for those of you who are not familiar with it, Guillain-Barre syndrome is this ascending neuropathy that causes just a lot of sort of weakness, and you can actually die from it because it can ultimately paralyze the diaphragm and cause respiratory failure. But then she actually got married a second time, now this is to a priest, and he ended up in the hospital with a lot of nausea, vomiting, he actually went a multi-system organ failure. And so he mentioned to the doctors that actually his wife had actually asked him, Blanche Moore at this point, had asked him to procure some ant poisoning that sort of clued people in as like, hey, maybe we should actually send a heavy metal screen looking for arsenic poisoning. 
And when it came back, it actually came back incredibly elevated and really clinched the diagnosis. And I really, I had to put this, these paragraphs in this newspaper article in here because I like it. Doctors threw a Hail Mary, right? They ordered a blood test for herbicide pointing. It was actually a urine test for, art, for heavy metals, but it was a Greensboro newspaper article from 86. And uh, arsenic poisoning more than 100 times the normal amount. I hope sometimes in 40 or 50 years, people can talk to me about me this way, right? Through a Hail Mary, made this like one in a million diagnosis. It's just such good sensational reporting that how could you keep it out? When I was actually reviewing this case, there's actually this book out here that got written about it called The Preacher Girl. And for anyone that's interested, it's so popular right now on Amazon, you can buy it for $3.50 on Prime right now. I know this because I actually bought a copy and started reading it. Um, just because I'm so fascinated by it. And, what they did is they went back and they exhumed Blanche Moore's father, her first husband, uh, Jim Taylor, and then her boyfriend, and they actually were able to biopsy their tissue and found they had incredibly high levels of arsenic as well. And so we know that she killed at least four people. She's actually still right now on uh, death row in North Carolina. I think she's the oldest woman on death row currently. Going a little bit more recently, 2003, in Maine, this is actually a church picnic, is there was a big arsenic outbreak. And what happened is someone was actually poisoning the church coffee maker with arsenic. And they eventually caught this guy, but unfortunately someone died, and I believe ultimately about 20 people ended up coming down ill. It's worth mentioning just because this is the largest arsenic outbreak that's ever been reported in United States history. This is actually getting a little bit closer to home, and this comes from, actually, in 1989, there was a case here at UAB, which Linda Thompson, who's somewhere in the audience, was actually telling me about this because she actually took care of this patient. And what happened, this is a 33-year-old male that came in, and Linda actually saw this patient in 89, and really came in with a lot of severe GI distress and got put in a room, thought it was gastroenteritis, a typical stomach bug but ultimately actually went to cardiac dysrhythmia known as torsades de points. And then afterwards it was thought, well, his magnesium level was low, he had some type of GI illness that's causing a lot of magnesium. When your magnesium level goes low, it puts you at risk of cardiac dysrhythmia. And then cardiology was actually about to put a pacemaker in him because they could never actually uh, you know, control his uh, cardiac dysrhythmias. But then his uh, white blood cell count came back incredibly low, and so did the rest of his cell lines. And so he was diagnosed with pancytopenia, actually had a bone marrow biopsy at the end of a very long, I think very detailed hematology consult note. They threw in a last line and said, oh, by the way, we should check some him out for heavy metal poisoning. So they actually checked this 33-year-old guy out and actually found that his arsenic levels were incredibly elevated. And what ultimately found out was actually it was his wife who had been poisoning him also with rat poisoning. I could not find an original article, but this is actually from the court case where uh, she got tried and sentenced to versus State state two years later. And the way they actually finally made this diagnosis is she was actually making a conjugal visit to this gentleman after he was recovering. And they actually caught him or her trying to give him more arsenic. And if you're one of the 13 people that texted me today, yes, I know the arsenic was in the news this morning. In fact, I don't know if anyone heard this on the way to work, uh, but there are residents in Montana, they're actually suing the federal government because there's a Superfund site that still has very high levels of arsenic. And NPR did a whole story about this. I think really just to bring, you know, we're still dealing with sort of mass contamination of arsenic in the United States even here today. And so, What's exposure? How do people actually get arsenic? Well, a big culprit, particularly in what I deal with, which is medical toxicology, is we always suspect poisoning still tends to be a uh, toxin, just like with Lavoisin and Aquatofana. It's still used very frequently in spouses trying to poison other spouses. Um, still tends to come up over and over. And it's a really hard diagnosis to make, because we'll talk about arsenic will just sort of mimic a lot of other diseases. But if you're going to get it a little bit more innocently, is your highest exposure to arsenic really in the United States is really ground uh, water. And because we know arsenic naturally comes from the Earth's crust, it's interesting that our drinking water throughout the United States generally has less than two micrograms per liter of arsenic. But both the EPA and the WHO say there should be less than 10 parts per billion of arsenic. 
This is really frustrating, I think, if anyone who actually reads about arsenic, because what does a microgram per liter have to do with the parts per billion? And when it comes to arsenic, your parts per billion is the same as microgram per liter. I only bring this up because whenever you read about arsenic, is some sources will talk about micrograms per liter, other sources will talk about parts per billion, and they're actually the exact same thing, and we just have not standardized it. So if you're ever doing your own sort of primary arsenic literature, let me just save you a lot of heartache and a lot of four-letter words. You're trying to figure out how different sources can relate to each other. But I actually pulled this actually from the USGS um, Society, right from their website. And it really looks at arsenic concentrations in groundwater throughout the United States. And you see, we're right here, which is green, so we have less than one part per billion. Again, the EPA says all water in the United States really needs to have less than 10 parts per billion. And the reason they came with 10 parts per billion is they did statistical modeling, and they think your risk of bladder cancer starts with chronic elevations of 15 parts per billion or greater. So the EPA said, hey, we're just going to cut that number by five. Um, unfortunately, there are parts in the United States that actually do have higher levels of arsenic, at least in a quarter of the well waters that they sampled. You see right here in Maine. Now, I do not think this is from that church parishioner. I think this is truly from the well water that's out there. But also parts of New Hampshire have high uh, arsenic in their water, which actually come up in a couple slides as well. Now, the physiology of arsenic toxicity. I gotta tell you, I find this absolutely fascinating, and I'm gonna try my best just to try to sort of translate that excitement to you. Because I, I think we make arsenic unnecessarily complicated. You know, we talk about it like it's a poison, but what the heck does that mean and how does it work? And particularly to a lot more of my clinical colleagues, which I see back there, is you know, when we start talking about sulfur bonds and covalent bonds and reducing things, I think it just puts everyone to sleep. But let's actually just break it down just a little bit and just bear with me is because we talk about arsenic, there's really about 13 different species of arsenic that are out there. And they're not all toxic. In fact, the worst offender is arsenic trioxide, which is a trivalent form of arsenic. And then the second worst offender would be arsenate, which is a pentavalent form of arsenic. And what happens is the natural sort of progress of arsenic, as you ingest it, actually gets metabolized down to these organic compounds or these organic arsenic uh, molecules and then eventually here will start getting renally eliminated. So when you think about arsenic poisoning, it's not all the same. You know, when we talk about arsenic poisoning, it's really the arsenic trioxide, the arsenite, because again in medicine we have to make things as complicated as possible, so we have multiple different names for the same thing, but arsenite and arsenic trioxide is really the really bad form of arsenic. And I think that's the important part to remember. Then as it gets metabolized off, we start forming these less toxic substances that can be renally eliminated. And then just bear with me here for a second, but I think, you know, what does arsenic actually do? Well, what it does is really the arsenic trioxide, it loves sulfur bonds. And so what it does is it binds enzymes that have these thiol groups and the sulfur moieties and really disrupts these really crucial enzyme processes. And Again, it's a little bit simplistic way of thinking about it, but what it does is it does shut down a lot of major organ functions. It shuts down CNS tissue. It really harms the liver. And ultimately, it can lead to ATP depletion. And this is also what puts people in a lot of multi-system organ failure. ATP being the main energy molecule that really sort of fires the body and lets it go out, uh, sort of produces all of our necessary enzyme functions. But another thing that arsenic does, and really, again, this is arsenic trioxide, is it inhibits glutathione synthesis, glutathione being the main reducing agent. And without that main reducing agent, it really sets the body up for a lot of these severe oxygen-free radicals, or RS species, which are just reactive oxygen species, and then can cause just a lot of oxidative damage. Incidentally, it can also block the potassium rectifier channels in your heart. Again, what does that mean and who cares? Well, this is actually how arsenic causes cardiac dysrhythmias because it impedes the ability of, excuse me, I walked away from the microphone, it impedes the ability of the heart to repolarize and sets you up for cardiac dysrhythmias. In that 1989 case, we were just talking about a 33-year-old, again, when the cluing diagnosis is something else that's going on with these cardiac dysrhythmias, and that's exactly from this mechanism. And then one of the final things that it does, and this comes up from a lot of sort of the trials are going on internationally, is it increases sort of platelet aggregation, increases your thrombus, and will put you at risk for certain uh, you know, cardiovascular diseases as well. I'm a visual learner, so for me, this is just a 
very, unfortunately, complicated way of thinking about arsenic, but also sort of shows just what we were talking about, which is what happens is you get a lot of damage to your antioxidant system. This is the reduction uh, or inhibition of glutathione. You also complex with these sulfur bonds on really important enzymes, and that's what causes a lot of the multi-system organ failure that you can get with arsenic toxicity, and particularly a lot of that pancytopenium. And then we know that uh, arsenic is also a really bad carcinogen. It can cause gene amplification. It can really also inhibit uh, DNA. And again, the free radical damage that it causes also hurts DNA, increasing your risk of different types of cancer as well. I really couldn't resist myself. I knew that was a really busy uh, couple of slides right there, particularly when we're talking about really the underlying biochemistry. I told you I got really interested looking at the history of arsenic. And there are so many people in history that have been killed by it. So I thought I would just sort of put a little interlude in here. This is King Eric the Fourth of, excuse me, the Fourteenth of Sweden. He was actually supposed to be this really promising young regent in Sweden. He was actually going to bring together Sweden and Norway. Then he started getting this mental instability and ultimately got deposed. And when he's deposed, he uh, got put in prison and very quickly and rapidly died. They were somehow able to find his uh, bones and figured out recently he's also had incredibly high levels of arsenic as well. And it's actually thought through folklore that he was actually poisoned by his pea soup. So when we talk about arsenic, number one is if you are going to ingest it, if you ingest it in an aqueous solution, it actually gets absorbed much better. When you inhale arsenic, it's poorly absorbed except for arsine gas. And arsine gas is more of an industrial exposure. It's a little bit outside the breadth of this talk. I was really focused on inorganic arsenic. But arsine gas, we do know from uh, environmental exposure, industrial exposure, does cause all sort of a lot of hemolysis, a lot of hemolytic anemia. In general, arsenic is not well absorbed through the skin, except with chronic exposure, it can cause a lot of skin breakdown. It's a thought if you have a lot of skin breakdown, then you could possibly increase your dermal absorption kinetics of arsenic. And this slide right here is really just emphasizing arsenic is really rapidly cleared from the serum, from the bloodstream. It very rapidly distributes to tissues throughout the body, and it makes the diagnosis of arsenic incredibly difficult. Because what happens is you can't just check a blood level, or your serum level is very frequently arsenic poisoning, can be undetectable. And that's why when we talk about arsenic poisoning, we know it's in the tissue, but it's not really in the blood. And our gold standard, as it was in 1900 and still today, is really a 24-hour urinary source, where we're just looking for sort of the leaching of arsenic from the tissue. And so we tar talk about, you, excuse me, start talking about sort of the acute onset of arsenic. It has this sort of idea with it called rice water diarrhea. And that's why that, again, that 1989 case that we had here at UAB, it came in with what thought was gastroenteritis. A lot of severe diarrhea, abdominal cramping. You can, uh, particularly with acute exposure, very easily go into renal failure. I mentioned multi-system organ failure where your lungs can take a hit. You can go into ARDS and respiratory failure. The cardiac dysrhythmias, that goes back to blocking sort of the repolarization that we know the arsenic does, causes QT prolongation and absolutely sets you up for cardiac dysrhythmias. In fact, I pulled this out of one of the hematology journals, and they're really talking about sort of the high risk of uh, arsenic trioxide, which still gets used as an adjunct for uh, chemotherapy agents that are out there. And this is sort of introduction right now, which we're going to talk about a couple slides, which is the HEALS trial. And the HEALS trial is really what's being done, joint venture between Columbia and Bangladesh. And they're looking at sort of the long-term effects of chronic arsenic exposure. But what's really interesting about this study right here, too, is they found that you also saw a lot of QT prolongation. It's that QT prolongation that sets you at risk for cardiac dysrhythmias. Interestingly, they found that it was, the incidence was far higher in female subjects than it was in male subjects. And every time you talk about arsenic poisoning, particularly that cardiac dysrhythmias, somehow you always have to bring up Napoleon. There's this great folklore that actually Napoleon died of arsenic poisoning, and there's a thought that he actually died from a cardiac dysrhythmia. What happened is when his body got exhumed and moved to Paris into that uh, big tomb he has now, is they did test some of his tissue, or really his bone, also had high levels of arsenic in it. 
Unfortunately, there's a lot of debate about this in uh, toxicology literature, and it's really thought that probably more he was, his uh, remains were initially put to rest near groundwater that had high levels of arsenic exposure or concentration. And so it's still hotly, I think, contentious in the medical toxicology world, but we finally concluded there probably is not enough evidence to definitively say that Napoleon was killed by arsenic poisoning. And as you go on to sort of more subacute toxicity, and these are people that, you know, ingest arsenic over days to a couple of weeks, you get this really painful peripheral neuropathy, and it mix, mimics Guillain-Barre, which is exactly why Blanche Moore's uh, boyfriend was misdiagnosed as uh, Guillain-Barre when she was poisoning him with arsenic in North Carolina. And then a lot of really painful neuropathy, but you also lose the ability, you get true motor weakness to the point where your mobility is severely impaired. You can get severe leukopenia and anemia. This is really as it, arsenic prevents the ability of meiosis, excuse me, of mitosis in the uh, bone marrow. And it's why you can get some really severe pancytopenia, get uh, alopecia, I have some photos of that coming up. And one of the things we always look for, at least as toxicologists, are mise lines. And these are disruption of the keratinization of your nail bed. And hopefully we can make these out here, but these lines that truly go all the way across uh, the nail bed, this is just really concerning actually for heavy metal toxicity, and particularly heavy metals that disrupt this nail keratinization. In particular, if we ever suspect someone's being poisoned, we see these, we're gonna think of things like arsenic trioxide, thallium, selenium, and antimony. Again, this goes back to that Kelnacki uh, book, which he described in 1910, a lot of just exactly what we're seeing. These hyperesthesias of the muscles, these uh, neuralgias, these severe uh, paresthesias. And this book is just so fascinating, I think a lot just because of the very colorful language that he uses, but it's still very consistent with what we know today. And these are actually, again, pictures from that Kelnacki book from that 1900 uh, beer epidemic. Again, you see the severe muscle atrophy, the uh, wasting of the lower extremities. And then here you actually see, this is a drawing that he put in his book, but the, really the hyperpigmented uh, skin lesions that you can see really with subacute to chronic arsenic toxicity. And when you start talking about chronic arsenic poisoning, it's really one of the things that you find a lot of people focus on are the skin changes because the skin changes can really just become so profound. You can get these uh, hyperkeratosis, you get these hyperpigmented lesions, these hypopigmented lesions. It puts you at huge risk for uh, skin cancer, both squamous cell carcinoma and basal cell carcinoma. And uh, Dr. Wilson, who's actually at Harvard, he has this whole library online which you can access of people poisoned in Southeast Asia with chronic arsenic toxicity. And you see here is actually sort of a hyperkeratosis of the feet, basal cell carcinoma of the hand. This is actually in arteris obliterans, also known as black foot disease, which I think is very easy, or it's a lot easier to say. It seems to have a high uh, propensity in Taiwanese population. And what it is, it's just really uh, vascular or avascular necrosis of the toes and the uh, finger uh, fingertips. It's not really quite understood why this seems to have a higher incidence in Taiwanese population whether it has to do with sort of the amount of arsenic that's being ingested or sort of genetic predis predispositions to it. And just some, again, some other photos that come from that online sort of Wilson library. So these, this is alopecia and sort of some skin changes from chronic arsenic exposure. And again, here you see just really these hyperpigmented skin lesions. Now, Part of this talk is really supposed to be, what's the future of arsenic poisoning in a way that we understand it? Because arsenic toxicity in 1900, that Kelnaki book, to most of what we understand now, has really become pretty stagnant. And that's why this HEALS trial, or this HEALS study that's going on right now is so important. Because what the HEALS uh, studies is a joint venture between Columbia University and researchers in Bangladesh. And what they're doing is they're doing these uh, extensive interviews with people in Bangladesh and what they're doing is they're looking for uh, organic samples, they're collecting blood samples and urine samples, as well as hair, uh, hair samples, and they're doing extensive health questionnaires. And what they're doing is they're following them along over a span of you know, a decade and even farther. And this is actually their original study model. What you see is 
anticipated to be a really good epidemiological study, you know, going forth and trying to see what sort of high level uh, information can we gather from this HEAL study, a very good epidemiological study. And so it's focused in Bangladesh. And why did they pick Bangladesh? Well, in the 1960s, UNICEF and the Bangladesh government installed all these hand pump water wells throughout the country and also in the eastern part of India as well. And they're trying to create pathogen-free drinking water. They had such a problem of microbial toxicity and people getting sick by all these pathogens in water. So they had very good intentions. But unfortunately, by the 1990s, as they started noticing all these skin changes, it's really what clued people in that they were actually having severe, chronic, arsenic uh, toxicity. And now on nationwide service, you see, you know, I think more than 10 million uh, wells, excuse me, have been, have extremely high levels of arsenic in them. And this right here is just a map uh, coming out really where people sort of plotted where are these wells in Bangladesh. You see they're really spread throughout the country. And then these are, you know, what exactly are these wells that were put in the 1960s? Well, this is actually what a, a hand well, it's just a PVC pump that goes down somewhere between 25 to 100 meters underground. And what they started doing is labeling the spigots. So the green actually means this is a safe water now, and the red actually means this is, uh, you know, consumes the high levels of arsenic toxicity. And so what's come out of this HEALS longitudinal study? And they're still actively publishing. And I think this is really where the future of our understanding of what chronic arsenic poisoning is going to, just these really good epidemiological studies. Well, they think that it's actually associated with hypertension in certain genetic populations. Um, certainly, there seems to be a high association with chronic cystitis, and that chronic cystitis can lead to actually hematuria, some postulated associated with renal failure, but also sets people up for bladder cancer, which is highly associated with arsenic toxicity and really transitional cell carcinoma. There's a lot of chronic respiratory disease we're actually finding out of this HEALS trial as well, as people sort of developing symptoms that are similar uh, to interstitial lung disease. And there seems to be a, some controversy about does chronic arsenic poisoning actually increase your risk of developing diabetes? And because the HEALS trial actually said it was inconclusive, at least in what they published so far, but there are other Taiwanese studies. Uh, Taiwan has also historically stu uh, struggled with high levels of arsenic in their well water as well. And the Taiwanese population, as they have published, that they are seeing an increased incidence of arsenic with diabetes. So I think that's sort of the future as we're starting to tease a lot more of this out. And again, all these citations are coming out of this HEAL study. Similarly, actually, in eastern India, now this is just over the border from Bangladesh, they have a similar problem, and there are other studies going on in eastern India. And so this is a, another study that medical toxicologists tend to cite quite a bit, and really what it's looking is a three-year study, um, and just looking at sort of what long-term chronic effects they're getting. And they're finding they're having, uh, in, Again, big problem with arsenic in this area of India, just over the border from Bangladesh. And then they're finding similar things. They're having you know, severe neuropathy, sensory disruptions, um, neuro findings. This can be sort of confusion, some encephalopathy. And what's also interesting, too, is they're reporting a lot of fetal demise and uh, miscarriages. They're going with people chronically exposed to arsenic. And then also this sort of chronic cough, uh, arsenicosis. Again, going back to sort of the HEALS trial where they're talking about a lot of these uh, respiratory findings. And then we know that arsenic, again, is a very sort of potent carcinogen, can cause lung cancer, skin cancer mentioned in basal cell carcinoma, as well as squamous cell carcinoma, hepatic angiosarcoma, and then the bladder, we think the transitional cell carcinoma is sort of the highest risk. And there are actually a lot of studies out there looking at arsenic's association with transitional carcinoma. And this last one I actually wanted to highlight because the first two are international. This one actually comes out of Dartmouth. And if you remember that USGS uh, map I put up in the beginning is uh, New Hampshire and Maine are absolutely struggling with high levels of arsenic in a lot of their well water. And the study out of Dartmouth is also um, showing a correlation or hypothesizing a correlation between arsenic and transitional carcinoma. You know, Dr. Oz always has to make the news. This came out about 10 years ago. He caused this big panic saying that, hey, his show had tested some apple juice, and there was 11 parts per billion 
of arsenic in some apple juice they found. Again, 11 parts per billion is such a low level of arsenic. I think this is really just Dr. Oz being uh, incredibly sensational. Unfortunately, after this report came out, is the poison centers were flooded about 10 years ago uh, with calls about people, a particular home, thinking that they had poisoned their kids with arsenic toxicity. This is uh, Vasil Tomini, another uh, usurper to the throne here in Moscow. And what happened is he actually, first he blinded his political rival, and then he expelled him, and then he ultimately killed him uh, through arsenic poisoning. Again, you can waste an entire day of just Googling famous people that have died from arsenic poisoning. The diagnosis of arsenic is really difficult. Um, this is, I'm going to always stumble over this word, uh, karyohexis, which is actually nucleus breakdown that comes from DNA destruction from arsenic trioxide. And the gold standard still today, as it was in 1900, is a 24-hour urinary concentration because we know that serum levels are just not reliable. The problem is, is when we check a 24-hour urine concentration, is it's just detecting arsenic. But as I mentioned before, the arsenic we really care about is arsenic trioxide. And this is what makes it so difficult, is when you get an elevated arsenic level, is it actually the bad form of arsenic, or is it more organic forms of arsenic, which is what arsenobetaine. And you guys probably ingest arsenobetaine all the time, because it is highly associated with bottom feeders, crustaceans, lobster, and shrimp. And when you eat arsenobetaine, your arsenic levels in your system actually skyrocket. The reason you don't get any symptoms from it is it's attached to these uh, sugar molecules that are unable to penetrate the cellular membrane. And so it's completely non-toxic. But our ancillary studies, our diagnostic techniques, are not able to differentiate arsenic trioxide really from uh, fish arsenic, which would be arsenobetaine. Now, there are very specific ways to do it if you really want to species out, but it tends to be very expensive and it's not available to most practitioners. And so what are the recommendations that are out there if we really want to avoid detecting fish arsenic and you really want to pick up arsenic trioxide if you're a practitioner in the community? Well, these are actually recommendations from Mayo Clinic, uh, NMS Labs, and Great Smoking Mountain Laboratory, recognizing the difficulties in diagnosis. And all of them actually talk about a 48-hour sort of abstaining from all seafood before you test someone the 24-hour urine concentration. I got really into to this actually uh, a couple of years ago because there's no good recommendations where this 48-hour rule comes from. So it's just purely a chance at self-promotion and talk about a study that I actually did. And what we did is I wrote seven healthy adults. Actually, these were seven medical students that were so desperate as an IRB uh, approved study that we got, but we just fed them a whole bunch of shrimp. And what we did is we checked uh, Q8 hour uh, urine and we normalized it to their urinary creatinine levels and tried to follow out their arsenic metabolism, trying to figure out if at 48 hours had everyone cleared what was presupposed to be fish arsenic. And one of the things I did not prepare for is how much shrimp medical students can eat. Uh, sub <laughs> subject D here uh, ate 136 shrimp and consumed uh, just over a kilogram of shrimp. And so these were our initial arsenic levels. Uh, time zero is actually supposed to be the baseline. Everyone had to abstain from all seafood. One of our participants actually had an incredibly high arsenic level, which we actually ended up going back and looking what he'd been eating. And he'd been eating actually poultry from Food Lion. You know, arsenic trioxide is actually used as a dehelminth agent in a lot of poultry. They're supposed to wait a certain amount of time. We ultimately actually got the health department involved, and this was in Virginia. But it was pretty impressive, at least in our data, is that you know, clearly here after 40 hours is people have very high levels of arsenic. And just for comparison, is our reference standard was anything over 35 was actually a toxic level. Again, it's just a graph showing that multiple days out, people were still having tox toxic levels of arsenic in their urine. And then uh, even up to 80 hours, some of these medical students. Now, trying to apply this to the normal person, because usually we're not eating 136 uh, shrimp, is a little bit difficult. And we probably should have capped about how many shrimps I was allowed to let these medical students eat. But what we ultimately uh, concluded um, in my very small study is really we probably should be waiting about a week and telling if we're going to work some of the arsenic poisoning, tell them, hey, absolutely no seafood, and really I would argue no poultry for a solid week before you actually send off a 24-hour uh, arsenic urinary test. And so as I'm wrapping up here, let's talk about the treatment of arsenic poisoning. 
And anytime you get any significant dermal exposure, you know, this is just bread and butter emergency medicine, you want to do sort of uh, decontamination. We know this rice water diarrhea, the severe gastroenteritis is such a problem, so we want to be very aggressive with isotonic fluids. Uh, AETSDR, which is a CDC, recommends getting a x-ray and actually looking to see if you see any arsenic. Sometimes it can show up on abdominal films, and if so, you would want to consider doing what we say whole bowel irrigation. This is actually making people drink a whole bunch of go lightly. I don't know if for those of you in the room have had a uh, colonoscopy, you just know how absolutely terrible that is. And I've actually never done this because usually when you have an arsenic poison, they have severe diarrhea to begin with. You think they're already probably excreting the arsenic anyways but it still does show up in some recommendations. And then there's really no clear guidelines on when to chelate patients. And so what are our chelators that are out there? You know, chelate is actually Greek for lobster claws. And I just find that really cool because you actually look at these different chelators. This is uh, DMSA up here. I mean, to me, it really does look like a claw. And if you look what's actually on these claws, as you see, these are actually thiol groups. These are sulfur groups. And why is that? Well, we know that arsenic likes the sulfur bonds of key enzymes. And that's the whole point about these chelators, the way that they were designed, is to have these sulfur bonds and tell arsenic, hey, you know, bond with me, let's make a non-toxic compound that now can be renally eliminated. And again, when you talk about sort of chelator therapy, is you know, what's an ideal chelator? Well, you really want something that's low toxic. And this is, I think, where we've really struggled uh, with developing new chelators right now. I'm going to talk about it in a second, but BAL right now is an intramuscular injection, and then DMSA is actually it's a hydrophilic version, really, of uh, very similar to BAL. And the reason that there's, that's advantageous is you can then absorb uh, DMSA, which is seximer, through your GI tract, whereas BAL still has to be an intramuscular injection. And one of the hallmarks of chelator therapy is delayed chelation is diminished chelation. We don't have clear guidelines of when you do want to chelate someone, but we do know if you are going to do it, you want to do it really quickly. You do not want to wait if you have a high suspicion for that 24-hour urine arsenic test to come back. So if someone comes in and says they've been poisoned or they're in an area where they potentially could have been ingesting you know, high levels of arsenic, is you want to be very aggressive early on. And unfortunately, where does this mantra come from? Because I get to tell you, when I was a tox fellow, this is what we always said, you know, delayed chelation, diminished chelation. It comes from this 1946 paper. I mean, this is really, I think, where our, you know, chelators have really been stagnant. And a lot of the literature we're still talking about, particularly with BAL, dimercapil, comes from the 40s and the 50s. And this is actually, again, from that 46, 1946 paper where someone actually developed uh, arsenic trioxide toxicity, and he was actually been, being given arsenic trioxide to treat his syphilis, um, de developed severe arsenic dermatitis, it's pretty interesting. They were actually, even in 1946, were able to measure his urinary arsenic in uh, milligrams here and showed that when they gave BAL, they were clearly able to reduce the amount of uh, arsenic um, that was sort of available for tissues. And this is one of the best studies we have out there about using BAL, which is dimercapil, in arsenic poisoning. And there really just has not been that much research about it. And BAL, I've had most experience with using, because we use a lot in lead toxicity, particularly in children. There are a lot of severe side effects. It's actually formulated in peanut oil. So if anyone has a peanut allergy, they can get severe anaphylaxis to it, cause a lot of hypertension. And it just causes unbelievable amount of pain. In fact, a lot of times we're recommending this over the phone through the poison center, and you can just hear these kids just like screaming in the background um, that go along with it. So, Again, Sexmar was developed similar to BAL, but they made it more hydrophilic. And with the idea that Sexmar is it can be absorbed through the GI tract, has a much more favorable side effect complex. And now, as long as someone can actually tolerate uh, an oral drug, is if we are going to chelate someone with arsenic, is most people, at least in the United States, would go to Sexmar, which is DMSA. I say in the United States just because internationally there's another chelator out there, DMPS which is not FDA approved in this country, um, that probably has sort of, it's slightly more efficacious at treating arsenic toxicity. And so what does the CDC recommend? Again, they recognize the fact that dimercapil, this is BAL. When it comes to chelators, we make it as complicated as possible. Each chelator has 
I think, four or five different names, but Dimer Capital, which is BAL, and historically it has been the most frequently recommended chelating agent, uh, but more recently even the CDC is recommending um, trying Succimer, uh, which is DMSA, just because of its much more favorable side effect profile and the fact that people can take it orally so they don't have to stay in the hospital for three weeks while they get chelated. And so where are we going with treatment of arsenic toxicity? And this is what I'm going to end on. And well, we can talk about future directions of chelators because our chelators that we have right now in 2019 are the exact same chelators we had by 1955, which is when Succimer really came on the market. One of the new thoughts or the new directions that chelators, I think, are going is taking things like DMS, DMSA and adding esters to it. And esters, what they do is they make the drug actually now more lipophilic again, so at least in the very early on treatment, is they have a higher uptake across cellular membranes. You know, one of the things we made Succimer hydrophilic, so you can absorb it through your GI tract, but now it has, its kinetics crossing cellular membranes are less than ideal. So the thought is, can you actually create a Succimer uh, type of molecule, add on these monomethyl uh, esters to it, and at least in the first couple of days, give it IV, really to be super aggressive about treating arsenic toxicity. And, this idea is still very early on. It certainly have not been any sort of high level uh, testing or evidence has gone along with it. And then there's a the thought too that, you know, can you combine these monomethyl esters initially with something like Succimer? So IV loads someone with the lipophilic ester version and also giving them an oral loading dose with the hydrophilic DMSA version. And then nl cysteine, you know, toxicologists love NAC, which is nl cysteine. You know, we see a problem, and we think that there's no problem that NAC cannot fix. Because NAC is such a good reducing agent, and we know it has very minimal side effects. You know, one of the big problems with arsenic toxicity is all that free radical damage, and also its inhibition of glutathione production. And we know that n cysteine can directly act as a reducing agent and encourage glutathione synthesis. And one of the reasons I think people are recommending um, nl cysteine that being said, is there still has not really been any high-level evidence. This is really the best study I could find about, and this is really just looking actually in a mouse model. And they found that when uh, NAC and Succimer were co-administered, uh, the, the mice actually had the highest return of their protein and their glutathione stores back to their uh, baseline levels. And then other future directions is really the role of antioxidants, just knowing again how severe that free radical damage of arsenic can be, is uh, melatonin can actually theoretically protect against uh, GMP, or excuse me, can increase GPX, which is an antioxidant enzyme inside CNS tissue. Vitamin E and vitamin C are well-known an antioxidants, um, as well as taurine that's out there. Again, these are all theoretical, and high-level research is being recommended um, but it's, we still have a long ways to go before I think these are real time. The reason I bring this up now is there are relatively safe drugs to give or safe compounds to give. So with a really severe exposure, this would be something that we would also consider. And then in conclusion, you know, the history of arsenic I just think is absolutely fascinating. Hopefully I was able to sort of share some of my excitement with you. You know, how does it work? Well, it really inhibits these sulfur enzymes. Chelate causes cardiac dysrhythmias, diarrhea, chronic exposure, you get a lot of cancer, skin changes, neuropathy. 24-hour urine test is a gold standard, but we really need a better way to test for this or really clear guidelines when we're going to send this. And if you are going to start chelator therapy, start it early. And then I'll end there. <laughs>